So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night for some of you, possibly. It's great to see you. I'm really glad that you have been able to make your way to this screen today, despite a, a few technical glitches that we're trying to work out. Um, and well, I think we've worked them out. So hopefully next time there won't be as, as much of a um, a labyrinth to, to get here, but here we are. I'm going to give people just a few more minutes to join. And then I was supposed to, uh, Kenny was supposed to introduce um, the series of which this is the first event, but he is not feeling well, so it fell to me. So I'm going to give just a few minutes um, before saying, uh, giving, giving you a little bit of sense of what we hope to do in this series. Okay, terrific. I will uh, let, let's begin. Um, so th this is um, narrating urban lives. Um, it's a, a collaboration between the Global Urban History Project um, and oops, a second. I have to keep sh shuttling around screens here. Just give me a couple seconds. Um, and um, the. Uh, the Critical Urbanisms uh, Program at the University of Basel, Utadu African Cities Workshop, which is actually in progress right now in Dar es Salaam, but based in Nairobi, um, the Urban Studies Institute at Antwerp University, in this case represented by Haita Bloch, and uh, the Beyond Inhabitation Lab. Um, and Kenny Coopers was the, and, and, and Wangui Kimari of Utadu were the main um, sort of spearheaders of this of the whole thing, and a bunch of us joined in to to help out. Um, so what we hope to do over the next five months is to reflect on um, what histories count or should count when narrating urban lives in the age that we find ourselves, the a planetary age, which we'll be talking about quite a bit today. Um, in so doing, we question dominant narratives to think through the political stakes of history as a plurality of practices and projects. Which ways of knowing and being and being undergird historical narratives and their temporal and spatial structures? How do ecological crisis and planetary awareness inflict our understanding of urban life worlds and politics? How to write a history of global modernity from the urban underside? What urban worlds does anti-colonialism conjure? And how does history writing as activism or advocacy engender new research practices beyond the archive? And these are questions that will frame our interdisciplinary discussion with the aim of advancing histories and theories that can do justice to the plurality of urban life. So um, as you can hear from the, the description, this event, um, which Kate will uh, describe in greater detail in a second, um, really represents a, a big step uh, in GUP's interesting interest in um, cross-disciplinary conversation, um, and partly because Maria Kaika is here to, to start us off with our intellectual journey today um, from the University of Antwerp, but also um, in her authorship of a collective volume uh, that brought together a lot of urban political ecologists, um, mostly working in sort of social sciences disciplines. So it's 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 really interesting to already be able to see the cross fertilization of their project with historical projects. And, you know, we're going to think a lot about today about how that can go uh, both ways. So that's that's a that's a big part of the, the, the program. And we also see this first event as just hopefully a first in a series of events that will explore that connection between urban history and urban political ecology and beyond. Um, so I will leave it to Kate to, to uh, pick up from there and tell us a little bit about what we're gonna do today. All right, thanks, Carl. Um, so yeah, in this first session, we start with a basic, um, yet very ambitious exploration of relations between cities and the planet. Of course, referring to recent debates in critical urban theory on planetary urbanization and more broadly, broadly to scholarship approaching the urban, the city, not as a prime, primary unit of study, but as a part, as co-constituted in relation with 
other socio-spatial constellations with forelands and hinterlands, as Carl described in his book, seeing the city and urbanization in relation to material, political, cultural flows channeled by capitalism and empire, as Matthew referred to, his, to, to it in his introduction, or indeed as a metabolism in which the commodification of nature supporting urbanization pushes resource frontiers ever more further in the extended, deeply uneven urban condition as explained in Turning Up the Heat, co-edited by Maria Kaika. For you who had the chance to have a look at the texts of Carl, Maria and Matthew, you might have noticed that all three of the essays connect the urban and environmental, cities, natures and power, continuity and change in a very palpable way. Yet when we screen the field of urban theory, a lot of concepts out there and a lot of critiques out there are all um, grappling in fairly abstract ways in how to define the object of city, city, cities and urbanization and how to bring them together. And also in urban history, the interest in global local relations, center periphery, city nature, human non-human relation is booming. Yet scholarship seems to go in two kinds of ways which are in tension with each other. Scholarship turning on the one hand to actor network theory and assemblage theories, or on the other hand, um, more structural neo-Marxist approaches. So the idea of this session is not to rehearse these tensions, these debates, but to rather explore whether a conversation between fields and more importantly, between schol scholars courageously expanding theoretical and empirical horizons can fruitfully enhance our understanding of the urban condition and even maybe reconfigure it. A conversation between global urban historians and political ecologists. And what we would like to explore with you in this session is in what ways theoretical debates in urban political ecology and empirical work on extended urbanization and situated methodologies are useful to historians? And what can historians' concerns with longer temporal landscapes suggest about these concepts? Add to these concepts. And ultimately, how can the empirical focus of both fields enhance each other? Wangui Kimari, who is in this room, and myself will moderate the conversation. And we divided the session in two parts guided by two very simple questions, yet very hard to answer. So apologies to the speakers. Um, so the first question is um, formulated as follows. What concepts best capture the relationship between the cities, between cities and planet, between cities and urbanization? And the second one is what places and processes should we research and how to give these con concepts empirical traction? The second part will be moderated by Wangui and the first part by myself. And just to kind of give you a bit of information about the, the choreography, um, at the start, um, the speakers will deliver a short prompt and afterwards we will ask them to react on each other's view, after which we will open the floor for questions of, of you, of the audience. And please do not hesitate to raise your hands and share your question with us. We would love to hear your thoughts and have a conversation with you. So please do not hesitate. Um, so I'm now finally, um, I have the honor to introduce our speakers in order of uh, the presentations. So first, it's an honor to, um, to introduce Maria Kaike to you. Maria Kaike is professor in urban regional and environmental planning at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on three interrelated themes, urban political ecology, cities and crisis, and radical urban imaginaries. Since 2010, she has been co-editor-in-chief of one of the leading journals in urban studies, the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research. And her latest book is an edited volume, Turning Up the Heat, Urban Political Ecology for a Climate Emergency, published last year by Manchester University Press from which you all received introduction and conclusion. Next, Matthew Witz is professor at the Department of History at UC San Diego, 
His research spans the urban, environmental, and political histories of Mexico. His book, The City on the Lake, Urban Political Ecology and the Growth of Mexico City, was published by Duke University Press in 2018. He's currently completing a Cambridge element titled Globalizing Urban Environmental History for the Global Urban History series from which you all received introduction. And finally, Carl Nightingale has taught world history and urban history for 30 years as a professor at the University of Buffalo and the University of Massachusetts, and is the author of Segregation, A Global History of Divided Cities, and recently, Earthopolis, A Biography of Our Urban Planet. He's a co-coordinator of the Global Urban History Project, and his presentation today comes from the forthcoming book, Our, Our Urban Planet in Theory and History, which will be published as part of the Cambridge Elements series in global urban history. So a warm thank you to all our speakers for taking part in what promises to be a very resounding conversation. So let's start with the first question. So what is in your opinion, what concepts best capture between cities and the planets? between cities and urbanization, what concepts are most useful to understand the urban condition? And Maria, would you mind kicking off? Thank you very much, Hit, uh, for the introduction and everybody for organizing this session. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so in terms of what concepts uh, might be useful, I will uh, focus on um, um, concepts within the urban political ecology framework, uh, two concepts in particular, the urbanization of nature and the concept of metabolic flows. And I will discuss how these two, urbanization of nature and metabolic flows, relate to the concepts of planetary urbanization and extended urbanization, which we elaborate in the book. So urban political ecology, I'll refer to it as UB, it's a funny shortcut, but uh, um, has a long history now. Uh, but I understand this is a mixed audience, so I will say a few things. So urban political ecology is a field that disrupted the canon, if you wish, in urban studies by making two key claims. The first claim is that there is nothing unnatural about what we call cities. Everything we see around us in cities, in bricks, steel, concrete, asphalt, are metabolized and engineered flows of natural resources which are put together and um, modified metabolized through human labor capital investment and technology and this process is governed by power relations the second claim up urban political ecology makes it equally there is nothing natural about a forest or a park these are also the outcomes of historical layers of metabolic flows between geological processes, go back to deep history, human and non-human labor, capital investment and technology. So UP claims that there is no city as such, there's no nature as such. There is a perpetual process, which I call the urbanization of nature. Uh, so this way of conceptualizing the relationship between city and nature, as a continuum of socio-environmental metabolic flows governed by, by uh, power relations, this way of conceptualizing both city and nature, or rather surpassing the divide between city and nature, is closely linked, and it gets a lot of its uh, um, mastered, if you wish, from uh, planetary urbanization. As it also as it was elaborated by Lefebvre originally, but then uh, further by other by many other very important authors, uh, and planetary urbanization here, of course, we refer not only to the fact that uh, more than half the world population now lives in cities, but more importantly to the fact that even those who don't live in urban environments um, or places defined as cities, they are directly or indirectly involved in assuring the continuation of growth and the global ur urbanization process. Um, so um, human and non-humans across the world are globally linked through the circulation of water, energy, fat, chemicals, viruses, disease, etc. 
And it's vitally important to recognize that galloping planetary urbanization is the main driver for irreversible sociological transformations. So UP examines how what Brandon Vincent uh, termed the imperial mode of living uh, in core urban centers is made in the global north and south is made possible only because it's possible to extract presumably unlimited and definitely underpaid power, energy, labor, land, and natural resources, and pollution sinks at a global scale. Core cities can afford to become smarter and cleaner only because they can dump their externalities elsewhere. As I put it, our increased sustainability and our increased smartness in cities is someone else's socio-environmental disaster. So if we focus on urbanization of nature and this global socio-ecological metabolic flows, climate change then is not some kind of collateral damage of capitalist urbanization, but climate change is part of the very modus operandi of capitalist urbanization. And in the perpetual uh, quest for growth, uh, capitalism creates uh, what we call uh, hybrids and cyborgs, uh, objects and processes that are neither purely human nor purely natural. It creates new ontologies, new landscapes, uh, but also uh, new ontologies of human, non-human uh, actors from dumped rivers and banked rivers, uh, fractured engineered landscapes to entities that blur the the boundary between human and non-human, like Dolly, the cloned sheep, if you remember, uh, back in late 1990s, to the coronavirus, zoonotic diseases, to artificial intelligence. So today, the dynamics of growth produce these violent and feral forms of urbanization that blur further the boundaries between inside and outside, core periphery, and lead to new waves of destruction and inequality. Uh, we have new forms of urbanization that are very important. Corridor urbanization, extend, extensive suburbanization, employment zones, office cities, infrastructure zones, production zones, logistic cities. And these are no longer hinterlands that serve some kind of, of, of core. They are forms of urbanization that create new and layered dynamics of growth and decline densification and de-densification, and they promote, of course, new forms of inequality, marginality, exclusion, and environmental uh, hazard. So although planetary urbanization for urban political ecology still remains a very useful concept, it has received a lot of criticism of the past decade that it's not situated enough to deal with the ontological complexities of contemporary urbanization, and also that it is a concept that always speaks from the core outwards and, and so uh, fails to, to um, speak from um, outside. So in the book, Turning Up the Heat, we propose uh, extended urbanization as a concept that can uh, perhaps unify us uh, and to go beyond the navel gazing academic navel gazing of these ontological discussions. What is a city? What is the best way to describe? And we find extended urbanization, a concept that is useful to push us to theorize the urban and the environment, not from the core outside, from but from its margins. Well, keeping attention to the core, of course, we cannot not do so, but also it's a concept that can help us expand our understanding of marginality beyond the traditional notions, actors, and spaces. So to complete my five minutes, um, we, we make a call to focus on extended urbanization. Um, and this call is linked, of course, to the calls for more situated uh, urban studies coming from scholars mainly working on and from the global south from post-colonial feminist and intersectional scholars. Um, that's, it, it, we see the possibility for a broader range of ur urban experience to inform theory and how urban environments are shaped, politicized, and contested. Uh, but this call to 
focus on an extended forms of urbanization and the urban political ecology of these is uh, not only a call to pay attention to different modes of power relations and uh, around the urbanization of nature, but it's also a call to decenter the very position from which research and theory itself is being produced and is being developed. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. I hope I haven't uh, overextended my five minutes. Perfectly timed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Already so much to discuss, yes. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, so we will move to the next speaker, Matthew. I can't see you right now. Hello, yes. There you are. Thank you. Um, so it's yours. Thank you, Maria, for, for kicking that off. That was that was really generative. So much to, to think about there. Um, and I also want to thank Carl and uh, Great for for and uh, and everyone else involved for putting together this this really you know unique conversation between global urban history and and UPE. Um, and as a as a relative newbie to global urban history, I'm I'm very honored and excited to be to be here today. Um, for me, and I'm I'm going to throw out a couple of concepts which I think um, can be can be fruitful can can help us um, uh, kind of theorize uh, and think about this relationship between city and planet over time. And for me, as an urban environmental historian who has done uh, research precisely on these questions of extended urbanization, metropolitan natures, metabolic and energy flows, urban metabolisms. Um, I've really come to see cities as uh, concentrated regimes of power that are also kind of differentiated by, by historical and spatial processes. Um, for example, various modes of production, um, but not only historically uh, capitalism, um, as well as, as imperialism. Um, and by a, a regime of power, I refer to, of course, political power, um, but also material energetic power, the water, the fuel, the foodstuffs, and, and the quote-unquote produced nature that, that compose uh, cities. So these conditions have meant that cities, or rather the rulers of them, um, and not always or necessarily just elites doing the acting, um, have expanded the reach of the urban outward in ways that um, have been contingent on their particular sort of historical material energetic possibilities, um, as well as uh, their sort of political might and, and wherewithal to expand. Um, and to understand those conditions that I outlined and to understand this uh, expansionary process, um, or perhaps if we're thinking with, with Carl and his text, um, we, we should be thinking more of them as, as quote unquote projects of producing and deploying power. Um, but in any case, I wanna propose that we, we um, consider um, and that we develop a concept that um, the urban historian Chris Otter developed about a decade ago, um, and that's called the, the technosphere or the global technosphere. Um, in Otter's view, the technosphere comprised of all of the technical and infrastructural networks that oh, produce. Excuse. Oh, sorry. Is can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, is right. So the in Otter's view, the the technosphere comprised of all of the technical and infrastructural networks that produce and deliver. Uh, urbanized nature to out of and between uh, cities. His purpose was to divide the concept that captured the urban explosions that Brenner and Schmidt so beautifully explain, but that which wouldn't conflate social relations and landscapes that have remained quite rural um, with an ur with the, the sort of the urban um, and cities themselves. So this to me is quite useful, but I also want to expand on its definition a little bit. Um, the technosphere um, also invokes uh, tools and rationalities, technologies of, if you will, of, of governance. Um, and here I'm thinking of the long history of urban techno managerialism 
um, rooted more often than not, or perhaps invariably, in certain environmental logics or rationalities, right? Around race, around hygiene, um, around sort of ideas of the conquest of nature, um, nature as a commodifiable uh, set of resources, uh, also around um, at times um, sort of environmental malleability or cultivation, um, and most recently around ecology or quote unquote sustainability. These technologies of, of governance, of power, uh, may differ across or do differ across colonial and metropolitan spaces, um, but they are also surprisingly consistent. Um, so these components of the technosphere have had a tendency to enwrap ever larger spaces, um, comprising both the human and the non-human, right, and what Maria calls um, right, the cyborg or the hybrids, um, into these kind of urban networks of power, both politically and materially. So um, time permitting, and I think I do have, um, I hope I have a few more minutes here. Um, I want to make one more point here about the relationship between city and planet. The concept of the technosphere occludes uh, histories of contestation, negotiation, and of alternative futures coming from subaltern, popular, colonized uh, peoples. Um, but urban rule that flows through or perhaps around the technosphere have long been fraught, whether we're considering uh, water supply projects, urban fuel wood and forestry um, um, products and industrialization, or more recently, fossil fuel development. So here I propose not just the technosphere to understand governing rationalities, which to me invokes a lot of Foucault, but also a kind of more Gramscian reading of urban environmental history and UPE, um, in which we look at the dynamic processes and projects of urban hegemony and counter hegemonies across spatial scales. So I think this approach does um, not only does a lot of analytical work and is um, you know, useful sort of for historical research, uh, but also has practical implications or perhaps applications for our world today of climate destabilization. Um, and I'm thinking here, especially as sort of this framing of hegemony, counter hegemony, or urban hegemony, counter hegemony, um, especially as it relates how we can build um, and what constitutes um, a quote unquote counter hegemony. Essentially for me, this revolves around how to dismantle the most um, explosive, if you will, component of the global technosphere. Uh, what um, urban theorist uh, Carola Hine has called um, our global petroleum scape. I realize that this opens up maybe a, a big can of worms, right? This is a topic way too complex for me to be able to delve into now, um, but I'm happy to discuss more my perspective on this sort of hegemony, counter hegemony within sort of extended urbanization or global technosphere. Um, um, I'm happy to discuss my perspective on all of this uh, during, during the discussion. Um, so I will with that wrap up and, and thank you for very much. Thank you, Matthew. It's it's um, so it adds a very strong historical dimension now to the to the discussion. Um, and now we move to um, Carl. Yes, thanks. Great, <laughs> and thank thanks. Me? Yes, can you can you hear me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Matthew, and thanks, Maria. That those are fantastic. Uh, introductions to what we're trying to do to here today. Uh, my my um, contribution dovetails a lot with some of the things you've said and also, you know, maybe also rubs up against it in, in occasional places. And I think those are going to be really interesting topics to, to think about. Um, and uh, the the thing that I gave out to you, um, the, the piece I gave out to you is, is, is um, arose from a, an impulse that we've been supporting at the Global Urban History Project to encourage urban historians to contribute more to urban theory than we have up to now. 
And it's great to see Matthew doing some of that, uh, some of that work um, in a really, uh, really uh, creative way. Um, so it's it's the it's the introduction to this our planet, urban planet and theory history, uh, my element and the Cambridge elements. Um, and from the preliminary thoughts that I offered in that in that reading, the element goes on to offer seven propositions, um, each of which is a variation on the theme. And the theme, the big theme, is this: um, it's the historical relationship between human space and human power. Um, making space, including all spaces we call cities and spaces we designate as urban, is not sufficient to making human power, but I believe space is essential to making power and vice versa. So the relationship is a dialectical relationship. Um, it goes both ways. It's also historical. It can be analyzed over time, and um, it changes in response to its own internal unpredictability and to many other historical forces that it uh, helps to set in motion um, and that set it in motion. Most important is the simultaneous history of human acts to harvest energy from the sun and earth, which Matthew and Maria both uh, alert, alluded to. And by energy, we have time to talk about energy in a more um, um, empirical way later on, but I mean a lot of different things that they've already mentioned, you know, everything from water to fuel to food to um, oil, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, anything that makes, uh, makes humans go uh, and animals our, our spaces go. Uh, so this, this is a pretty perilous, unpredictable business, as we know. Uh, natural energy that um, gives us life can also just as easily snatch life away. Um, and producing human power by means of concentrating natural energy in cities and urban spaces is also a perilous business, almost as likely to dest destroy as to create. Um, I, I like in, uh, the, this effort to, uh, um, to a kind of existential bet that we made, um, apparently quite consciously, actually, when we first built cities 6,000 years ago. The history of cities is not only the history of um, about producing space and power, but also about how we amplified human space and power um, to a greater degree in cities than we could in any other type of space so far in history. Almost all of our most powerful institutions, movements, and other collective acts, and by this, and this includes imperialism and capitalism that have been alluded to, um, you know, we amplified power, typically unequally, over other people and other spaces, human and extra human, including planetary. Today, humans have used our power to destabilize an unusual 11,700 year pattern during which the sun and earth related to each other geophysically and biologically in such a way as to provide relatively stable deliveries of life-giving geosolar energy. These deliveries made cities possible, but now cities make it possible for humans to disrupt this pattern, and the relationship between sun and earth is likely to become my, much more life-endangering than life-giving in the future, or at least it risks that. And that way, cities became critical instrument of our own power, not only in space, but over time. We not only make human history in cities, we make earth time. This... Um, this sort of central theme relies on arguments about cities and the urban. First, cities, I think, must remain central to any concept of the urban. No urban condition exists without cities or existed before there were cities. But cities alone are insufficient to understanding how their production led to new possibilities for amplifying space and power and human and human extra human affairs. We must extend our concept of urban as Matt and Maria and others have argued. But as we do so, I think we have to also recognize that extended is not sufficient um, geographic category to classify all urban spaces. My arguments about cities and power start by dividing the urban into three parts. One, cities. Two, spaces that make cities possible, generally hinterlands. They could call, also be called a variety of different other things. And three, spaces that cities make possible, or what I call urban forelands. Each of these can be further divided in ways useful for empirical research, and we'll talk about that later. Um, I also recommend that we adopt a graduated concept of urban that um, allows us to identify varying urban qualities of non-city spaces 
including spaces that also deserve the title suburban, rural, infrastructural, and or extra human or natural. The historical record tells us that the combination of these varyingly but demonstrably urban spaces has grown and diminished in size over the 6,000 years of global urban history. And at reasonably identifiable times, the sum of cities plus urban hinterlands plus urban forelands accelerated to planetary dimensions. In our own time, we have twinned our planet with a space power phenomenon I call our urban planet, Earthopolis, the giant multifaceted political ecological space in which we enact human, uh, immense human power over Earth in unequal ways and even in its relationship to the sun. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, so nicely um, interwoven history and, and theory. Um, I see a lot of um, alignments, but also some friction uh, here. So maybe um, uh, would you have reactions to each other's prompts? Or would you like me to ask questions? <laughs> <laughs> either is fine either is fine okay then maybe um you choose first uh, maybe you can react on each other's prompts first okay. you want me to go first you you can yeah sure maria thank you uh, thank you uh, matthew and carl this is a uh, great and indeed there are lots of commonalities yeah i wouldn't call it friction um just to react, there's so many, but let me just react to one for Matthew, one point and one point for Carl. Um, for Matthew, uh, yeah, this, um, I actually fully agree, this global technosphere is a very, very useful um, concept and entry point for understanding this uh, global process of urbanization and power relations. Um, and with this, uh, in UP with uh, Eric Sungedal, for example, and uh, um, uh, Alex Loftus as well as used uh, the concept of techno natures. And um, um, so this, this is well aligned. I think we're very well aligned there, but I want to point out that one, one uh, place where we think the important place is that we're looking at the same direction. So behind everything that we've said, all three of us, we're looking at ways forward, uh, ways to disrupt uh, existing power regimes and relations, and uh, how we can uh, mobilize these, um, yeah, different, uh, for example, in, in Matthew's case, is global technosphere to do that. And uh, I just want to bring in the discussion, throw in the discussion a, Matthew, you're probably aware of it, this emerging um, uh, movement of infrastructure activism. And uh, I'm currently involved in two projects, one project in Amsterdam, we're doing one project here where we disrupt uh, the infrastructures of planning for urban green and see how, how with it's with Deborah Solomon and Carolina Neveja. And uh, indeed, there's a lot of uh, leverage there. And I, I think at this point of time, and given the global state of affairs and global capitalism, uh, to me, it's very important to find levers, like, uh, and those have to be real material. And that's why infrastructures are so important in technology, because they can't be mobilized as leverages as these infrastructure activism cases show so well. So yeah, and one point of reaction, I don't want to take up much time to Carl, is, um, Yes, I, 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 I really like this uh, gradual uh, concept of uh, urban, um, and in a way, um, you know what I described as extended urbanization. I don't find that as antithetical to what you say, um, but I think uh, again in the search of. Uh, mm, artifacts, technologies, or places that can become leverage for change. What we see today across the globe is that these radical imaginaries that disrupt uh, the uh, global hegemonic power tend to come from places of the margin. 
And this is one reason why, in my view, uh, we ought to be paying more attention to this place. And we do actually, all three of us, I don't think we disagree on that. But this is for me one important reason why we need to pay more attention to that. But then the whole process of uh, linking or scaling up or making those uh, small pockets of alternative thinking and acting and praxis, transporting them geographically and even historically, th this is this is where the the big labor uh, is required, uh, both political labor and praxis and um, uh, conceptual labor and uh, research and all that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um... Indeed, there is this um, clear um, network line between all of your talks, um, connections, kind of the material political um, dimension of um, networks and infrastructure. That is kind of, kind of a very palpable entry into the into urbanization. Um, as well as kind of the, 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 the political concentration of power, um, as the concentration of power in cities. Although I do see, have a feeling that um, um, the theory, um, the proposed extended urbanization uh, proposes to look at uh, power concentrations outside course. As well. Well, yes, uh, uh, pay attention. Yeah. I mean, we all know it, it, power itself has shifted radically. The the big uh, pockets of power are no longer states. You know, you have global elites uh, that uh, um, exert um, as much financial power as empires used to, uh, and the yeah, these elites are located in uh, in in centers. Uh, but then how these power flows uh, come and hit different locations and then hit back into these uh, power centers, it's a very different process. We haven't, I don't think uh, we have uh, explained, researched, explained or articulated this uh, enough. So in a way, the way things move in terms of changes in power relations, power hegemonies are much faster uh, than the the slow labor of academic work to research and conceptualize and divulge and and uh, disseminate. Maybe I, I can jump in on some of that too. I mean, this begins to overlap with the empirical side of things too, and, and I think you're deliberately doing that, and it makes a lot of sense too. It feels to me that you know um, that the metabolisms, as you call them, or the the interactions or the um, uh, the, um, the the many different parts of extended urbanization all have um, all become important to each other. Um, they become sources of power to make all other parts work. And it feels to me like you know that there is some there's some. I, I, I hear you gesturing to to what what hope can we find from talking about this um, for, you know, a planet that actually will sustain life, um, you know, as, as well as we can make it sustain life going forward, um, given what we've done to it already. Um, and and I, I I get the, you know, the, the, the one, the, the, the image that's coming up to mind is that there's a lot of Achilles heels in these connections. Um, there are, uh, there, there, there are farmers in France right now who can you know, stop infrastructure, but they also, you know, surround Paris. Um, so they're they're looking to various different. Uh, they're 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 trying to use these critical spaces where things are weak in the system, or could be weak, could be made weak in lots of different, very creative, um, creative ways. Uh, thinking of the siege of Delhi not so long ago, but you know, the largest really siege of any city. <laughs> Um, all by tractors and la lasted for a really long time too. You know, think things uh, on those on those orders that that um, that uh, are sort of multi spatial um, and that recognize in some ways intrinsically what we're trying to talk about theoretically that that these places are are interspur that are inter interact with each other all the time. And um, so anyway, I just want to put out there that it doesn't. I, I, I'm I'm interested in extended urbanization i'm interested in the focus on 
uh, away from centers and so on. At the same time, empirically, I feel like, well, yeah, but centers really still matter an immense amount. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the elites you just mentioned spend huge amounts, invest huge amounts of money into those centers. They've been multiplying um, drastically over the last, during the same time that ur urbanization has extended more uh, radically in all other directions. And um, and they're still very important to states. States cannot do without them. Uh, uh, empires cannot do without them. Capitalism cannot do without them. Uh, international um, uh, elites cannot do without them. And um, and so they're, they remain important. And I guess I, you know, I want, I want the entire urban to be at play here. And I think that the entire urban has to be at play in order to really disrupt some of the worst things that we're using cities for and, and the urban for. But Matt, I bet you have some thoughts on this too. Yeah, um, I just, I'll, I want to thank you, Maria, for for um, bringing up the the sort of the, the infrastructural activism that that um, has been going on, and that and that many different people have proposed <laughs> as a course forward. Um, and it reminds me of this this movie I watched about a year ago, and I'm blanking on the on the title, um, but it it takes place in in somewhere I guess in the Western U.S. Um, and it's it follows about four or five eco activists who come to detest fossil fuels um, in different ways based on their own kind of personal experiences um, uh, in in both cities and in in more rural areas, um, and they come together, uh, and and it's all about how they you know how they want to take down a. A pipeline. I think actually it's called. I, I think it's actually the title is uh, "Mom's." The title of Ma Andrea's mom's book, "How to Blow Up a Pipeline." Now, <laughs> now that I'm remembering, yes, it's the title of the book itself. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend that that for viewing. Um, it didn't get a whole lot of recognition, um, uh, probably or most likely uh, because of how polemical it is. Um, and Maria, you know, I'm glad you brought up this this question of or, the, or this topic of growth, right? Capitalist growth as kind of spurring these this extended urbanization or this sort of these planetary urban explosions. Um, and um, you know, I think it's a you know we can kind of think historically about about capitalist growth, you know, urban capitalist growth and, and its relationship to our planet. And we can think about it, of course, as um, uh, different energetic possibilities at different points in time. In time. And referencing Malm again, right, who, who made the, the argument that it was in fact um, our um, extraction of coal and then later petroleum that made possible this, this, this growth um, and 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 sort of undergirded the the hegemonic ideology that we have that we need growth right and that growth is always good um and you know I, i'm also you know interested in thinking about this you know this process of growth historically as fundamentally colonialist right it's you know it it didn't make colonialism possible right for sure fossil fuel driven growth or fossil capitalism mm -hmm. But it certainly brought it into a new sort of level of intensity, right? Um, it accelerated it to a degree never seen before. Um, and we're still in that process, right? Um, we're still in that kind of capitalist, colonialist growth. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, and, I, and one question I have, I guess, is to what extent can we talk about that as also, as also just an urban process, right? And I'm wary of kind of, um, you know, I'm wary of turning everything into something urban um, uh, because, you know, it's then it's like if everything is part, part of this urban process, then then it's also nothing <laughs> in particular. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are, are on that. But but it seems, you know, historically, empirically, right, we can't think about um, our daily life with growth without thinking about colonialism right um and so 
Yeah, that's just uh, just one one thought I had. Um, I definitely agree, um, Carl, that you know we we can't take our eye off of um, cities themselves. Um, but I don't. I also don't see a whole. I also don't see a whole lot of friction here. You know, Maria also brought up that you know um, while we have to you know remain focused on the on the marginal, the marginalized, and the peripheries, um, it's a dialectic of of core and periphery. Right, that's that's producing, um, producing in a, in a sense this kind of urbanized urbanized nature, um, and certainly I I agree that right that it's at the it's oftentimes at the the peripheries where you know where we see um, where we see these kinds of you know what I would like to call counter hegemonic po uh, possibilities, right? If we're we're thinking back to politics, right, not just the sort of um, regimes of power and governance and deploying force and um, and 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 um, um, amplifying power, but also in the sort of ways in which um, the ways in which uh, people have uh, over time um, legitimized themselves, right? Sort of bought in, if you will, to those amplifications and those productions of power coming from from core cities. Uh, but also the ways in which you know all kinds of, of non-elite actors have at various points, right? And I'm thinking here in the history of you know environmental movements, the history of environmental justice, environmentalism of the poor, um, labor environmental coalitions over time in the U.S. and elsewhere uh, that have been to a to a certain degree, right, pushing up against um, these these. Um, these urbanizing forces. Um, yeah, Maria, you had a direct reaction. Sorry, may I, please? Because I have a very direct. Of course. Um, my connection is unstable, so I sometimes close my video uh, so that it makes it easier somehow to continue engaging. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think Matthew and Carl raised very, so many so important things, but I want to latch on to this um, environmental movements and growth um, and um, and urbanization. Um, I think we have we we see today we see today something very significant, and it's not new, but uh, an increasing. Um, um uh, fault lines between the environmental movement and the labor movement and um also interestingly the the say farmers uh, it's the rural uh, that uh, argues against uh, green yeah and uh, pro growth and you have more urbanized environments the, the service economy in in Europe at least um, um pushing more for a green uh, more green kind of growth now this severance as we know the environmental movement actually was born out of the labor movement uh, particularly uh, and, and starting with uh, african americans uh, arguing against toxic uh, work relations and all that uh, so they they started like this and now they're uh, getting further and further apart, and I, and and they they're becoming rural versus urban, and they're also linked to the increase of um, populism and uh, far right movements. These are all interrelated. And, uh, populist far right movements are more rural, and then the urban is more progressive, as it were. And um, I think what we as um, thinkers, researchers, activists, um, is a very personal view, uh, uh, um, need to focus more on is to uh, um, both conceptually, but also in practice, bring those, the environmental movement, the labor movement talk again together. Because when we talk, because growth, if we accept that a global uh, growth, the expansion of capitalism is dependent on unequal global ecological exchanges, these are not only exchanges of matter, of resources, of food, they're also unequal exchanges of labor, labor power, human and non-human labor power. 
And uh, I think we need to weave that uh, seriously into our account of how we produce urban. Um, and I want to point at the work of Stefania Barca and uh, Matthew Huber, uh, who bring uh, labor back into our understanding of these uh, fault lines, or it, they're fake fault lines, actually. But they are people, we don't want to go into that discussion about ideology or not, but they, people perceive them as real material fault lines. When it comes to their livelihoods, people feel green, green, greening or um, post-growth as a threat to their jobs. And it is a threat to the jobs. But in parallel, we see um, a number of very enticing uh, movements from um, uh, laborers, from people who work in factories who have been laid off or factories that have closed in Italy, in the US, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, who take over the factory in cities and try to produce a, a new type of uh, post-growth uh, or green, greener kind of capitalism or non-capitalist social relations or, um, you know, uh, less unequal uh, uh, power relations. So it's a very exciting moment, politically speaking, and all these are, things are happening in parallel. The horrible, uh, you know, the the, the um, uh, green growth as a uh, green uh, as a growth engine, yet again, uh, in, in running in parallel with populism and uh, far right movements, running in parallel with wonderful alternative imaginaries and infrastructure activism. And cities, of course, are at, at the center of it all, but not alone. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not hooked up on on extended urbanization of cities. But one last thing, and I'll shut up, is that, um, and and I while we academics um, and I I'm um, equally responsible um, spend a lot of effort in debating the urban what is the city how do we define it actually cities become even more important in uh, global uh, international politics uh, the uh, sustainable development goals for the first time the, the new urban agenda puts cities at the heart of change but this is a techno managerial type of uh, of uh, cities are put at the heart of it because they can produce economies of scale in a techno managerial approach towards uh, greening capitalism and i think yeah this is the kind of of uh, procedures we need to resist against in my view i'll shut up sorry oh well, thank you for that maria i, I think also um many things that that you mentioned um, earlier, but also now in in, in your talk about um, uh, labor relation and, and and kind of the, the reproduction of um, yeah, of inequality. Yes. Um, um, I think it's it's a hypothesis, um, but from hearing hearing you talk and Matthew and Carl, um, I also wonder whether. Um, um, the, the, the perspective either of a historian looking at, at, at causation and at, at, at projects um, makes you shift your gaze maybe more towards concentrations of power um, and um, urban political ecology or might look at effects more um, would that be, um, or trying to understand, um, kind of trying to capture um, uneven, uh, uneven urbanization, and trying to to kind of to grasp them? Because I had to think, but um, both uh, Matthew and Carl were talking about you should look at pro at a project, at a process, instead of maybe at, at a process. Um, so history has this um, has this 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 drive to look at at causation, um, and and I wonder whether that defines where we look at um, what what our object of study is or what we're kind of uh, where, where our gaze is shifting shifting to. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think it overlaps with you know Moya's sort of pressing political strategic concerns in this in this uh in the in 
you know, in the, in the time that we find ourselves, um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's lots of different ways in which academic knowledge can seem to skate over those kinds of concerns or, you know, dig into them in various different ways. And, um, um, just, I, 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 I'm wanting to respond to Matthew's, Matthew's idea that nothing, that we can't have a situation where everything is urban because I sort of, I sort of do believe we can, but um, we'll get to that maybe maybe as we go along. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about the different ways in which we think about uh, causation, and I think in social science too, we have a lot of words that end in I-Z-A-T-I-O-N, -A -A you know, ization words that are meant to, you know, clarify that this is a big, huge process, and the people who are pushing it forward probably can't individually stop it, you know, or even the, even the most powerful people in that can't, can't probably stop it on their own. You know, it's, it's sort of this thing that goes off and, 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 and operates on its own uh, internal dynamics in such a way that it, it's almost become a machine. And, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think there's, there's room for that um, in history as well. And we've certainly adopted process in a big, big way. Uh, we use process all the time and we've been, we've inherited from social sciences. Uh, how exactly is an intellectual history that somebody should write? But um, yeah, I, I throw out project just just as a kind, of, and I think Maria, you'll you'll appreciate this that that the um, the project is brings it more to a human scale. It says here here are the people who are living urban lives. Here are the here are the um, uh, purposes that they have, the, the intentions that they have. Here are the alignments that they build in order to get those in, intentions. Um, it, you know, enacted in some way or another, and here are the obstacles they face. It's a very my my uh, my daughter took a literature class in third grade, and 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 the, the 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 teacher said, "Okay, all stories are somebody wants but so." <laughs> and I think that that kind of uh, narrative, like get, getting, is kind of the molecular. It feels to me like the molecular um, molecular stuff of of causation ultimately and um being able to get, to get to that to see processes probably going on but also to see how they uh, how they come into being through those um somebody wants uh, but so uh, uh um you know that's that's what we see when we open an archive box i think maybe more than you guys see when you have a data set or those kinds of things we see people you know, it's it's a mess. <laughs> it comes out. It's we have no idea half time what what kind of what what part of that story any any one piece of paper that we look at um, tells. But, but we have to put it together. And one way we can do it is go to social science and say, okay, this you know this capitalist process is going on here. It's very clear. Or we can say, you know, somebody wanted, um, but so. And and I think I think it's just two different ways that we ought to all have in our toolbox, maybe. Um, and I just tend to want to see the other, to, to see the more, you know, the urban lives, narrating urban lives really requires narrating urban lives, um, not necessarily narrating urban processes. That's 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 mostly my point of that. I don't know, Kate, if that gets anywhere close to what you were, you were yeah, seeing. Yeah, it's, it's, of course, I think it's also a kind of, um, uh, maybe a moment here to, to, to turn to the audience and um, ask for their input. Um, I, I think the chat is disabled, so... Uh, yeah, I will open the chat. Yeah, um, but, but please um, raise your hand and you can just ask the question in person. Can I just uh, add while we're waiting for the chat to come uh, to... Carl's very uh, good observations. Thank you. That I, I mean, I would be the last person to argue against focusing on the urban. <laughs> Not at all. I'm just saying that the urban, in the way I look at it, is, is this process of flows. But also, that is uh, you. It's impossible to look at all flows coming together. We're talking about them now, but of course, in terms of research practice, and we will come to that in the second part. Um, it's like opening your box, the equivalent with doing urban political ecologies. You know, I follow one element. I follow water, for example, right? That's what I've done in one of my books, City of Flows. I follow water and the history of water and how water, uh, in order for us to turn the tap 
leisurely in our home and get water. What what does it take? Uh, what rivers does it take to dam? What uh, mountains does it have to pierce? How many uh, labs and laboratories and labor have to abstract it and clean it, etc. Uh, so we need to focus on one uh, element or one box, if you wish. Otherwise, we can't say anything uh, meaningful, as it were. So I fully agree with you, Karen. Rich, uh, forgive me, uh, but would you prefer no. to? Would you prefer uh -huh. us to uh, to uh, ask our questions in the chat, or should we raise? No, our I, hands? I think it. I would prefer you ask them in person. Okay. Uh, but if people feel more comfortable asking it in the chats, they can do so. But if you're okay with asking it in person, just go ahead, Rosemary. Do you have a question? Uh, sure. <laughs> certainly. Thank you. I think Matthew was going to uh, respond as well, but. Um, I, I will throw this out, and it's a, a question about broader geographies of understanding as, as researchers. And I wonder in this really wonderful conversation and uh, conceptualization of extended urbanization, or however you would like to, uh, to use that vocabulary, the idea of flows and networks, um, whether or not our geographies of the global north and the global south, or the, uh, the the way we've understood broader ge geographies from a planetary point of view really function any longer. I mean, do we have to reconceptualize the way we understand planetary geography in relation to ideas of extended urbanization and extended flows? And I wonder about that, especially in relation to the environment and to climate change itself. Um, that is going to force changes in how these flows take place and how extended urbanization exists. So, um, you know, I wonder if we're placing um, all of these really outstanding conceptual understandings of the urban on what is an older geography um, in a planetary sense. So I, I will just throw that out there. I'm not sure if I agree with what I'm suggesting, um, but I'm 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 simply wondering when I look at our, our global geography whether it makes sense any longer, um, given all of the strains and crises that are taking place around climate change, and around this new understanding of of extended urbanization. Thank you. I just say one word, which I think uh, Maria really um, brought up very well in the beginning, and Matthew it was throughout um, his remarks but it was probably a little less. Um, central to what I was saying. I mean, all of these things operate in, on planes, you know, incredibly unequal planes um, and uh, our, you know, what we call the global north is riven itself by massive and growing inequalities, let alone the global south, which is riven by its own, you know, massive inequalities and, and divergences and so on. And in some ways, you know, that the could be, it, it, I think it's just important to remember that whenever we talk about power, it's being exercised, it, 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 almost by definition, it's being exercised unequally. Um, so, so you know, the, the, the discussions that go on sort of perennially at the COP talks are also very, very true. The amount of, you know, carbon that the global north produces is far, far, far outweighs the carbon produced in um, the global south traditionally defined, however we want to do it. We have to take China out of there, um, uh, which is a tricky thing too. Um, we know that. Um, so the, these these concepts are, of course, you know, like process, like project. They're, they're all they're all somewhat blunt, but um, it, it does feel like acknowledging that basic hemispheric um, inequality is still to me very very important um and will remain important for a long time um and we can also look you know trace its history too because it wasn't always there but um the the, the difference between production um uh harm suffered and practices that actually go against global warming for example um th th those things are very very unequal between the two hemispheres and within the hemispheres yeah, this is not, I'm not suggesting in any way those inequalities don't exist. Of course they do, um, you know, certainly. Um, and they're very obvious and they're continuing to change. I'm suggesting is there a, non, a different way of understanding them? 
um, is as we move forward. Yeah, maybe if it's okay, I'll jump in now. Um, thank you for that that really um, important question, Rosemary. Um, my my thoughts on this are a little bit jumbled right now, but I'm going to try to make sense of things um, as I speak. Um, my sense is that you know if we take a longer look at you know if we want to call them relationships between global north and global south, of course those are you know, those are new terms in, in historical sense of like maybe the last 20, 30 years. Um, and for such a long time during the Cold War, right, it was first world, second world, third world. Um, and then before that, it was, you know, take your pick, um, advanced barbaric, modern, traditional. And, you know, it's not that the succeeding terminology has always um, you know, has always superseded or or sort of overcome the the preceding terminologies. Um, but yeah, we've come to kind of look at this sort of global north, global south, um, and of course, we're upsetting these 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 typical kind of colonialist binaries of of progressive, traditional, or modern, traditional, etc. Um, and you know, my sense is that. Um, the you know if we think if we think sort of historically from maybe the 1940s onward uh you know the the third world was was as um i think it was um prashad who, who said you know the third world is not a place it's a project right so third worldism right starting in the 1940s all the way through you know definitely through the 70s if not the 80s as well uh, right was a kind of a political a shared political ideology um uh, with 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 differences in terms of you know like what kind of structural change people were actually seeking but they were sort of more revolutionary marxist um anti-imperialist um um iterations of it and then there was the sort of more of the sort of like state diplomacy, let's work within the global institutions to reform them, you know, questions of economic nationalism, resource nationalism come into play there. Um, and, and what we saw, what, what, as, as sort of counter hegemonic, if you will, or sort of as, as um, um, anti status quo in terms of the global order as these, this project was, um, it also very much reproduced the the old kind of modernization logic within the sort of developmentalist frame, right? We're talking about the age of development at this time as well, right? In which, um, you know, third world elites, right? Pa uh, uh, Chatterjee has talked about this. Other historians have, have looked into this, right? Third world elites, revolutionaries um, in charge of their governments, right? Um, um, you know, they they adopted, right? They kind of reproduced the old colonialist framework that their people, right? Now citizens in the decolonized world, but that their people needed to be reformed, right? And that reforming the people required a transformation of the land, okay? Um, and required urbanization, right? Required making new cities, expanding old core cities, right? So I think that's that's something that remains with us today, I would say. So maybe there are new geographies of power that we have to consider, but I am, um, you know, I'm thinking that these, these processes are still ongoing, right? You not you not just have, of course, like global north, you know, sort of imperialist or colonialist projects, right? This is not some you know not some legacy, but something ongoing. But you also have uh, what Latin Americanists used to call internal colonialism, right? Um, and that these things um, these things are still with us, and they are um, they are producing space in the global north and the global south right um 
and they are producing space, but they're also being right. There, there are also challenges, and right? there also there's also been a kind of since the 1970s, in particular, a sort of um, you know a sort of. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Matt. I'm, I'm yeah. I have to I have to cut you short. I'm sorry. Oh, am I going on no, and on? I'm sorry. Not, not, time is, <laughs> is moving. No, but your passion yes, is of course, good. Of but but time is moving forward, and there are still questions from the. I'm audience. Trying to make sense of myself, I. I, I know, I know, on. but it's it's super yeah. interesting. So sorry to. Uh, yeah. To, to, so um, maybe one fast um, question from the audience, and then we move to the second part, um, if that's okay with you. Um, Ilya, you had a question? Um, I do, but I, I see that uh, Matthew Heinz uh, already wants to comment for quite a long time. So maybe uh, give the floor to Matthew first. All right, uh, and yeah. your, your question for the second part, Ilya, then. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, you can all hear me, I assume. Um, so this is uh, kind of, uh, I guess, maybe more of a comment than a question, but as far as these issues of um, sort of between North and South or between, um, you know, cities and, and quote unquote, more first world or developed countries versus others, um, you know, maybe the book, um, the work of Jennifer Robinson, I know she wrote the book Ordinary Cities, um, it's been a while since I read her work, so I'm, I'm kind of speaking in ignorance here, but maybe some of her ideas about that kind of trying to break down these distinctions we make between, you know, so-called third world versus first world cities and so forth. Um, you know, maybe that's a helpful starting point because I do feel as though sometimes we get a little bit too obsessed with kind of North versus South and, and so forth. Um, and, um, you know, there are other, I mean, not that it's a bad framework necessarily, but there are other frameworks as well, intellectual frameworks to it, kind of ways to think about that, I, I feel. Yeah, thank you for that reference, Matthew. Um, the comparative urbanism um, um, discourse is for sure very relevant here. Um, Ilya, I just, when Gui said to me, give the floor to Ilya before we move on <laughs> so uh... okay that's that's uh thank you very much Wangui. um no a very fascinating uh, discussion and and fascinating uh, material also so thank you for um um exchanging all that material and organizing this this very um uh, good discussion uh so i had, I had several uh, remarks that might touch on on some of the things that you said um, so I agree with um, uh, with Matthew um, Fitz that that we should be weary of indeed turning uh, everything in, in into the urban. So the the concept of of extensive urbanization seems to be quite liberating, but also maybe holds the risk. Uh, I was thinking of indeed turning everything into the urban. Um, um, and I'm I'm also thinking about theory that is out there. Um, as starting as, as Maria also outlined uh, with that notion of planetary urbanization, uh, especially if you link it then to, to this notion of, of operational landscapes, uh, which is also sometimes used in, in connection to this, um, that, we get, we, that we then also start to see or start to look at rainforest or for instance, the Arctics um, as being part of that uh, uh, process. And I do see how they are connected to economic processes, processes of, of, of um, uh, economic extraction and so on and so forth. But isn't there a danger that we uh, lose our focus on uh, the city understood as a kind of nucleated settlement? So the city as a, as a place where where there's urban living going on in a social and cultural meaning of the word. So where the living in some way or another is, is different than in, in other types of settlements. So, um, so there is this, this, this continuous uh, friction there uh, that especially in urban history, what we are looking at is, is in a way also urban living and how urban living matters and how urban living is going on in, in this kind of nucleated settlement, uh, which is meaningful from a social and cultural perspective. But then if we bring in notions of, of extensive urbanization, I think they really make sense from an economic point of view, but 
how are they also related to to the notion of of how does it feel to live in a city like more the notions that that uh, Georg Simmel and the like were really interested in to to study I'll just answer really quickly and and put out my my um you know my general feeling about how lots of things can be urban if even if they aren't cities um I, I think one of the one of the problems is that urban is so linked to city that whenever we start to use it for a village, we start saying, oh, no way, it can't possibly be, um, you know, village living is so different than city living. Um, one thing I, I don't think we've brought into our vocabulary enough are non-city urban places. So we can say that they're not cities. Make very clear, we're not talking about cities, <laughs> um, but we are talking about things that have, to some degree, uh, an urban characteristic uh, or another. And these could, you know, it's important from a historical perspective, especially when, you know, I I got commissioned to write this 6,000-year history of, of cities and their connections to the rest of the world kind of thing. That's what it was. And so I began thinking about this, and I said, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that there were times when there was nothing, you know, nothing was urban <laughs> at all on Earth. And then there was a time when cities came into being and certain things became beyond the cities became urban, too, or at least partially urban. They may have been out there in the middle of the countryside. They might have been mines. They might have been forests. They might have been, um, you know, uh, rivers. They might have been any number of things. But to some degree, they had an urban, um, they had, a, they had a, a role in creating the cities. And from there, also, just the idea that once you started the cities, you could create institutions, movements, and other collective actions that were far more powerful than anything you could do in a village alone or in a nomadic camp alone and so on and so forth. Um, once that happened, it seems to me that something very big changed in human, in human life that's still with us. Um, and that is that cities became essential to all kinds of things and, and, and to the, the much more complex we often use the word complex. I'm going to try to, that's, that's, a, that's a complex series. So I just, I'm just saying that, you know, we can see places that make cities possible and, and uh, places that cities make possible as a, as a kind of urban, um, as urban phenomenon um, that, that require some, at least some an analytical understanding as urban, um, even though they're non-cities. Yeah, I, I see that, Carl, but don't you then take a very essential process out of the equation, namely the, the living itself, the, the, the settlement structure in itself, the the way No, no, I don't think you do. Yeah, I think you I think you you very clearly distinguish cities from villages and every other kind of settlement. Um and you say the life is very different in all of them, and you to some degree impute the quality of life or the, the, the net nature of life in those places. Um, you see it as as something that, that uh, also helps to allow cities to become as important as they do institutionally and in terms of movements and in terms of collective acts. I think this is the ideal moment, actually, to to go to the second part um, because indeed it's it's um, how to then to then um, study these places and qualify these these spaces. And what Ilya said, um, um, how to so that this so. You have the theories and the ideas looking at cities, spheres of influence, networks, you know, up to the, you know, planetary scale. But then how do we kind of um, study the place uh, in itself and, and appreciate all the differentiation um, and different qualities? So um, I will give Wangui the floor to introduce a second. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I've really learned a lot in this preceding discussion. And um, my role is to try and help us engage in this forum with a question that I've just put in the chat. So what places and processes should we research and how to give these concepts empirical traction? And in doing in thinking about this in a in a collective manner, what I wanted to do was talk about how I arrived uh, at a at a really I arrived or I, I came to use urban political ecology, which was a very very indirect uh, route. In my work in in Nairobi, I I look at how coloniality endures in the city basically, but I found that a big gap in the literature was 
looking at how uh, ecology was part of the imperial enterprise. So not just in terms of ecocide, as we're seeing in Gaza, but in terms of uh, dividing who could live where. The Europeans only wanted to live in a specific section because uh, they didn't want to be in a floodplain where there were mosquitoes, or, or they also wanted to be at a high place so that they could have a vantage point for surveillance. So ecology was a big part of, of the imperial enterprise. Tied to that, how ecology was maintained also helped bolster the notions of, of the imperial power, how lawns were kept, what lawns looked like, what trees you needed to grow, whether you need, need you, were, you were to have jacarandas in avenues and not say native plants. So really ecology was a big part of the imperial enterprise in many ways. And so really while doing my PhD research, I saw this that unfortunately ecology was not being foregrounded in these discussions about how uh, the colonial city was produced, but also how it was maintained. And so for me, this is how I came to urban political ecology because it's really the empirical work and how people were narrating their space and their 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 lives, really narrating their lives in in context of environmental apartheid in the past and present, that led me to urban political ecology. One thing I would say though, and I I write about this in uh, turning up the heat, is Nature also is is uh, is also part of people's interiorities, how people's subjectivities are seen. So, for example, in the chapter I write in Turning Up the Heat, and thank you, Maria, I don't think we've actually met, but thank you for the opportunity to be in that book. People's nature, what was seen as their nature as subjects, was then normalized in a nature that was produced. So people's interiorities, if they were seen as uh, bad and uh, over-sexualized and, and dirty, then that was also, was having a symbiotic relationship with their land, with their living in what a right calls deficit geography. So if Africans were given deficit geographies, then in turn, and in a symbiotic relationship, their natures were also seen as deficient. And I feel this is maybe a, a way, that was a way for me to extend what I had seen in the landscape and maybe extend my usage of UP by also thinking at what was naturalized uh, for as people's subjectivities. And related to that, and speaking about cities, Africans were not meant to be in their cities, in Nairobi at least. They were not seen as, the city was not their nature and their nature was not meant to be in the city. And so there was a big, uh, there was always a big, uh, you, the British government was always writing about how we can't have these detribalized Africans in the city because the city is not their nature and their internal nature, their interiority, becomes corrupted by uh, the city space. So this is how, for me, I've I've used what I've heard in the landscape and in people's lives to begin uh, to use uh, UPE. And so I, ju I just wanted to talk about that just to create the space or some context about how people, what do, what, do our audience members, what do our speakers think about this? Is it important to start off with a context, sorry, with a concept and see how it applies in space? Or is it more important to start with the empirical and let it lead you there? And by way of conclusion, so that I can give space, I think I'll also, if I can let the panelists, sorry, if I can let the audience members comment and then we give the panelists time to respond to perhaps my intervention and other interventions. Um, just by way of concluding, I would say that for, at least in Nairobi, I've seen a lot of concepts uh, used which really have no bearing on people's lives. If we think about, um, for example, a concept like gentrification, it, should we use gentrification or should we use evictions? Should we use land grabs? How are people narrating their lives? And it's important to 
to really call attention to sometimes the lack of fit between uh, what how people are narrating their lives and then the context that are superimposed by an academic literature. But that's just a small intervention to create a path for us to discuss. And again, just to repeat, this was prompted by the question, what places and processes should we research and how to give these concepts empirical traction or said differently, should we start with the place and then the concept or the concept then the place? So over to people. I don't know if people have any questions from the audience. Uh, I'm being a dictator, so poor, poor speakers, I'm going to ban you from speaking for a short moment. Let's see if there's anyone who can respond to this or feel free also to intervene in, in the previous discussion. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure if, if was I one of the people who was banned or, or uh, can no, I... no, no, no. <laughs> the, the dictator unbans you. Go ahead, Matthew. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, so I guess with the whole issue of the, the empirical versus the concept, um, obviously it, it's certainly going to depend on the person. It's this kind of subjective thing. But I guess I'd say as far as one's research, you know, you uh, all of us, we spend we spend so much time actually doing our research that I think kind of on an empirical level, uh, just on a basic kind of factual subject topic level, it needs to be something that really kind of that one finds really sort of viscerally fascinating that one that can maintain one's interest for, you know, three or five or 10 years. Um, and, you know, sometimes just just a concept isn't isn't necessarily enough. It needs to be something that, you know, an actual place or people and so forth that one events that one really finds fascinating regardless of and the concepts may change over time uh, of course for some people maybe just the abstract concept for some people might be fascinating enough and then it all can follow from that i guess the other thing i'd say is just i think um you know in some sense maybe the empirical facts always have to be a little bit preeminent because the because you know if you're a good scholar you know, your interpretations may change as you uncover more facts and as you discover more relationships and, and subtleties that you, you weren't aware of in the beginning. So I think you have to, one has to be, you know, hypothesizing from the beginning with ideas and stuff, but one also needs to be flexible enough and, and avoid, you know, not, not be too dogmatic so that when, as one does more research and uncovers more facts and information, you know, you, you discover that one, one hypothesis doesn't work but then you learn about some other concept um, that might be perfect. Um, and it's just important to be, to be kind of flexible enough to be open to that. Thank you, Matthew. Um, anyone else? Go ahead, Alexia, yes, please. And yeah. for, I'm, I have to scroll through many Yes, of course, uh, sorry. I figured, I figured that uh, <laughs> you'd see me because my screen's on, but... Um, uh, not not anything very important to say, but I just wanted to reinforce what you said, Wangi, because I think it it you know obviously it gets a, a little bit at and, and my I'm unhelpful because I always scale up to like the biggest epistemological problem of like the social sciences, but um, but that is the tension, uh, the productive tension of trying to think historically and then also in terms of sort of, you know, applied social science, right? So we are trying to figure out what we do, as Carl said, you know, with our box of stuff. Um, and so we grab for some concepts to make sense of it. Um, but that, you know, is what we do in time is exactly the scenario that you are mapping for happening sort of in the present moment, right? Which is like, we take an alien concept and we impose it on people that it didn't make any sense for, right? Um, and that is, um, you know, those people aren't there to push back at us, um, which I am personally quite grateful for. Um, but that is, uh, that that's exactly uh, what we do. And it's a, you know, it's a privilege. And then we have to, we have to balance it with the violence that that does. But I think what it gets us to is the fact that, and you know, the theme of this series, which is about narrating, um, <clears throat> again, each of these kind of narrating urban and lives also important, um, but it's about how it changes the story we're able to tell. Um, and so maybe if I could connect it to a little bit of the conversation earlier, 
Um, I was interested if there actually is a tension in two of the things that one of the things that Carl said and then the, how Maria was talking about extended urbanization. Because um, I was thinking about, you know, the degree to which discussing um, and Matthew put it this way as where well, like that everything is to some degree urban. And Carl mentioned in passing that that I suppose, I don't know, Carl, you've probably worked this out, right? But <laughs> a graduated model of degrees of urbanness. Um, but then in listening to the discussion of extended urbanization, as Maria introduced it at the beginning, I sort of thought, I mean, do we need that, right? Or is it actually just, we just make the claim and then it changes the story we can tell. And does it matter if we have a sort of a, a, a firm categorization of degrees of urbanization and ways of, or degrees of urbanness um, or cityness and ways of recognizing it? And I suspect it probably matters if you want to, I don't know, convince a politician and rebuild a city or convince a community to advocate for a certain kind of change. Um, but I'm not, I don't know that it matters so much um, in terms of our, our political argument, right? I mean, and, and actually this chimes very well with Matthew's discussion of, of the notion that these things are, they're, they're projects, they're imaginaries, they're claims that we're making so that it can enable us to do certain kinds of work. Um, and, and so it just, I don't know, is there a tension there or, or isn't there? Can I be unbanned, Mungui? <laughs> um, of course, sorry, uh, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was, I, I'm bursting um, with 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 <laughs> thoughts, and they're all over the place. Um, but uh, you know, I think I think I'm I'm long from going from theory to an actual um, practice. Now, this has been I've been up in the stratosphere for some time, and I I, I really do, but I really do think that there is um, research practice praxis um, implications and in, in thinking about uh, these degrees of urban. That is that are useful in 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 a, in a bunch of different possible ways. Also, though, um, that it really isn't good enough to just say that they're all urban. There are, you know, that this this uh, this urban has to be um, uh, it has to come in it has to come in pieces and it has to be classified with not just by degree but by you know, by various different kinds of substances. So I have this urban forelands versus hinterlands as one degree, the cities versus non-cities urban um, as one possible way to go. Um, but the, you know, there's every particular energy form where you mentioned water, um, you know, there's, uh, Matthew mentioned oil. Each of those has a history that's um, that's urban in, in its own interesting way um, and extended urban in this interesting way. And you could put on, you know, wood and we've already talked about it, almost all of, all of the different kinds of energy food, obviously being a huge, huge, huge one. Um, and then the other thing that I did when I was, so part of this was about trying to write a big, long narrative, a possible narrative of what 6,000 years looks like, you know, what does what, what 6,000 years of history look like? Um, and so, you know, for the first 5,500 years, I saw, I think rivers and fresh water were much, much more important to, 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 to the whole operation of everything urban. Um, we're, we're central to that. And then we found that there was an ocean that covered the entire world. And once we did that, you know, we were able to create many, many more cities using the, the winds and the currents of the ocean, saltwater. Um, and then finally, you know, discovering hydrocarbon and how it can be used to, to propel um, city growth and many other actions um, seems to be really important. So, so that, you know, subdividing these things is, is as important as giving them uh, kind of degrees of urbanness. Um, you know, I think, I think they're, they're for a, a big narrative, it's, it's useful to have times when we can see the outside of the urban, when we could see the outside of the urban. Now, I don't really, I, I can I can argue pretty much you know any any spot in the world has some urban function including the, you know the South Pole North Pole whatever we we you know the depths of the ocean uh, where there's plastic um, floating around you know at, at seventeen thousand feet below the surface and so on and so forth we could we could go almost anywhere and find something urban yeah. um, but I, I don't think that's always true so you know to the extent that we want to think about well where did that boundary expand and contract that's that's interesting. Uh, Kind of, you know, it's a thought too. As far as people goes, I mean, one way I think you really, you really force us to really get back to urban lives, and you know, um, 
there, there I think I'm a, I'm, a, I'm much more fractured, but I, I do feel like each of these, um, you know, wielding power in cities, wielding power outside cities, wielding power um, is always um, uh, always involves the whole of the. It, it is always central to empirical what we want to do empirically. It feels to me, and also you know in what we want to do uh, politically, and also what we want to do in terms of bring narrating lives. And so I'm I'm kind of a political determinist in that way, with the political of urban political economy, um, with you know racial politics, with gender politics, with everyday politics, with infra using that word in the, in the broadest possible way, cultural infra politics. I just think that that's that's the heart of the matter. That's where the the the, the life life meets space, where it's spa where um, uh, where where um, all these concepts finally matter or don't matter um, empirically and politically. So I'll just stop with that. Can I jump in for just a second? Um, uh, so yeah, Carl, I I totally agree that. Um, virtually every place on earth, the air, the water, the deep sea, right? Um, the poles, right? Basically everything could be seen as partially urban in some way. Um, I guess my, my bigger concern is that we then take that partial urbanization and then base entire research questions and approaches um, using kind of global urban historical or UPE lens. Um, and I'm just not, I'm just not entirely convinced by that, um, considering that, for example, if you're looking at um, deep sea mining uh, or what have you, certainly there's an urban component to it, um, but that these topics, um, these kinds of topics and the, and the questions you ask uh, need to be coming from sort of more of this sort of epistemic pluralism, right? Of, you know, there's STS, <laughs> there's uh, environmental studies, there's post-colonial or decolonial uh, theory, right? That can help us sort of uh, piece together um, histories of, of um, or studies of these kinds of um, projects, right? These kinds of extractivist projects that that have urban components, but aren't entirely enwrapped by them. I would just say that nothing is entirely enwrapped by urban, <laughs> but everything is. And and so is it, this this is why I, this is why I, I I believe in dialectics that are necessary but not sufficient. Um, so all of this stuff is also capitalism. All of this stuff is also empire. All this stuff is also and and capitalism and empire also are urban, you know, so or or in in, in dramatic and drastic ways, and very very importantly, so, um, so that, that's mostly what I I'm not I'm not saying there's only one one thing that matters in the world, and that's you know what what we can do from cities. I, I'm I'm saying that what we do from cities is matters a huge amount, and um, let's let's make sure it folds into the make sure we fold it into the analysis. That's that's mostly what I have in mind. Just, uh... Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have to take over the moderation because I think Wangui, her connection is really bad. So um, I think she she left um, our digital space for now. Um, so I will I will do um, the moderation, and I'm looking at the time. So we're 15 minutes before five. Um, and I think Wangui um, did a very had a very good strategy to turn it around and to first have a discussion and um, um, then end with the thoughts of our panelists on on place. We we have um, discussed already somewhat where to look um, and how you know how to connect places and politics. Um, and our research to politics, but I I would love to hear um, Maria's thoughts, if you don't mind, Maria, to um, to give your thoughts on it. Sure, thank you. I'll take five minutes. Um, uh, first, just uh, briefly, 
I'll start with this uh, conceptual versus empirical work. I don't believe in this uh, differentiation at all. Um, it, at least when I go in the field, I can never theorize outside the field. I believe in grounded theory, uh, but I need to go in the field with concepts in my mind. I don't go with empty head, although I go with an open head, but not an empty head. And the concepts are, and the theories are the lens through which I can see the world. So if I choose to do actor network theory, which I don't, and I don't because I don't believe in flat ontologies and that all actors have equal power. I, I, I strongly don't believe in that. Um, within urban political ecology, I don't even, extended urbanization is just, don't get this wrong. I mean, it's just a, a way of saying, don't, uh, we were trying to unify the field, the field in this book. So we were saying, let's come up with one term and let's get this over with and focus on what matters. And what matters is power relations that produce and reproduce and destroy uh, the urban and livelihoods and environments alike. So in, in, in within this framework, what is to be researched it is four things. One is um, in order to understand urbanization, and I actually don't talk about cities or the urban, I prefer to talk always about urbanization as a process. And that gets away for me with all this is city, urban, no city extended. So in urbanization, to understand urbanization, we need to look outside and underneath the cities and all those dams, mines, deep sea, uh, fracturing landscapes and all that. So first and foremost, to map these processes and understand these processes and these metabolic flows and power relations. But quantifying those uh, flows is by no means enough. This is what uh, industrial ecology, for example, does it, does it fantastically well. That it's not enough. In order to understand the power relations behind and how these affect human lives and non-human lives, uh, we need to go beyond this quantitative mapping and understand this dual metabolic circuit. It's dual. One circuit is uh, a cycle of economic investment, a disinvestment, and the other cycle is a cycles of environmental and social destruction uh, and reinvention. On that. So if we focus on this, uh, urban political ecology focuses on this dual metabolic uh, circuit. Um, and I will give you a very example, sort of ground all these, right? I, I live in Amsterdam. I, I see Amsterdam's beautiful canal houses every day. So if I were to study Amsterdam's canal houses uh, within a framework of housing studies or even standard political economy or real estate economics, then um, I would look at global investment flows and uh, try to explain why each uh, multi-million real estate transaction for one of these houses is linked to housing crisis and housing inequality and marginalization, okay? And that's very, very significant. But if I, what I do, I examine these uh, canal houses in Amsterdam under political, uh, urban political ecology framework, then what I do is I try to explain not only how and why each of these real estate transaction exacerbates housing inequality and crisis, but also how and why each of these transactions exacerbates environmental destruction. And to do this, it is not enough to examine aggregate real estate pricing data or even get qualitative local data. Uh, to see how global real estate speculation is linked to environmental destruction as well as uh, local inequality, I examine Amsterdam's canal houses as sponges, and this is where the history comes in, sponges that have absorbed century upon century, layer upon layer, the profit that had been extracted from exploited natural resources and bodies of men and women across the world in fields of Suriname, Ghana, India, Angola, Senegal, South Africa, Indonesia, in ports, uh, mines, oil rigs, breweries, cigarette and biscuit factories, windmills, tulip plantations, you name it. All of this exploitation of nature resources and sweat ends up being piles of bricks that create the city of Amsterdam and Amsterdam's canal houses uh, in particular. And this is not only something that happened in the past and stopped there, but each time a new real estate transaction takes place in a city like Amsterdam or any other, 
fresh amounts of profit extracted contemporarily in, uh, from labor and resources around the world, all this fresh profit sinks again into the urban, the places we call cities and this particular pile of bricks that we call Amsterdam's canal houses. So this is a kind of epistemological, methodological vehicle that I use uh, to in urban political ecology. Um, and this is not just a academic exercise, it matters politically. Uh, and also the like, talking about places, looking at those places outside the urban matters politically. For example, when Berger depicted the US suburban fringe as no man's land, in 2017, this is not simply an academic representation. Uh, accepting U.S. Arabia and Norman's land means ignoring millennia of metabolic flows between humans and non-humans that produce these landscapes. And it means, of course, ignoring generation of power struggles over land between indigenous peoples and settlers. It means neglecting the history, past and contemporary of the power dynamics that produce these landscapes that eventually become urbanized. Um, so yeah, I'm very aware of time. I'll um, I'll stop here. Uh, but uh, and I think just to say one more thing is it's very important to move our academic politics beyond ac apocalyptic scenarios, and I think we all do this here, and to look for those cracks uh, that enable us to move forward. And there are several cracks at this moment out there. We need to document them, but also also to theorize them, but in a grounded way. We need to be there out in the field, see what's happening, and then and then use those lens. And a good good field work, that's what I always tell my PhD students, if you do good field work, it's going to upset, unsettle, or even reject your concepts, the concepts with, the, with which you went into the field. And that's how we move our, our academia forward as well. So, thank you. If I go now, I can give Matt the last word. Matt, would you like to? I would I prefer to give you the last word because I kind of we kind of set this up so that I I was the third person. Um, I'll just say, Maria, thank you very much for that very evocative um, analysis of of piles of bricks near your near where you live. Um, it it feels to me like it it does a number of different things that historians um, should do and uh, ways of deploying the concept urban. Um, amongst many, many other concepts. Uh, my, I think one of the things that matters the most to me is that is that uh, we think um, very, very imaginatively about space and that we the way we um, categorize space and and name spaces um, and delineate them is very, you know is is, um, is as creative and as interesting as it possibly can be, in part because whenever we go to our evidence, which may be bricks that we, you know, we know about in Amsterdam, but most often is a bunch of paper in a box, as we've we've talked about before, or it could be some at times interviews or oral interviews and so on. Uh, we're we have a, we have a choice of way to answer them. This in this way, I'm going sort of just responding a little bit to Matthew as well, uh, Matthew Hines as well. Um, we have lots of choices of way of, of interpreting them, and a spatial imagination I think just helps us to read. A, we talk about read against the grain, read against scale to think about ways in which something that's happening very clearly in a very small place um, has, you know, has inputs from. Many, many, many possible places, including you know just how you described um, the the bricks that make up the canal houses, but that also radiates outward and has effects and consequences. Oh, Wangui's back! Thank goodness, <laughs> it's you. Um, and um, so I, I just I, I think most mostly what I want to do when I'm pressing questions of urban and non-urban is to think um, is to is to interject various different. Um, conceptions of space in, in and, and give us as, as wide a palette as possible for understanding them. And I think that's important. Um, I think it's ultimately important politically too, because our, so much of our political strategy making and, um, you know, I have my own firsthand um, experiences with that too, involves what space do you target? What space matters? <laughs> what space is, as Mary so evocative put it, is the lever. Um, and that's the thing about politics is that it, 
it operates in space and it operates by means of space and so being able to identify spaces and all their and all their complexity is yet another way of, of also um noticing the symbolic potential and the actual um uh you know real material potential for those spaces to become um openings or um achilles heel and the bigger power dynamics and so that's 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 mostly why i want to um you know what why i want to see the see each space as as created multi-causally multi and uh, multiple multiple scales that interact on a um on a continuous basis matthew go ahead great thank you to both of you for those really fantastic comments um i think my my comments dovetail with what you've already said in fact i might be saying almost the same thing in a different in a different way um i guess my short answer to the question is let's do both simultaneously let's think about the concept and think about the place um and you know for for me you know i i wonder if 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 our entry point is demystification right uh, kind of thinking thinking along a kind of marxian lines of commodity fetishism right and and maria actually in an earlier comment um said something that uh, that that um in very beautifully um that i kind of wanted to say here which is you know wherever you are in the world um you know think about where the things that you consume that you use uh, think about where they come from, how they were made, how they were brought to you, um, what relationships, social relationships of labor, um, of, of environmental processes, of non-human nature that, that compose those things that you use. Um, so that's what, you know, that's where I think that we might be able to sort of depart from. And then that's going to take you right into whatever you want to call it, the technosphere, extended urbanization, these metabolic flows. Um, and uh, the, I guess, um, you know, and of course that that technosphere is, is, is global and enmeshed in these histories, right? Uh, these layered histories of colonialism and capitalist expansion. Um, and then once you're in the technosphere, right? Um, I, you know, I try anyway to, to avoid state centrism or elite centrism. And as a historian, it's somewhat difficult oftentimes um, to, to, to stay away from that state centrism since so many of the documents that we look at were produced by the state and its agents. Um, uh, but, you know, by um, accessing different kinds of archives, different kinds of documents, different kinds of sources, at times, as, as Carl pointed out, using um, oral history, um, we can be attuned to the to social history, right, to the everyday experiences, the space making um, practices, uh, political contestation of of these sort of state capital projects that um, are themselves deeply urban, um, and we can be attuned to also right other ontologies, right? Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking um, particularly of you know uh, uh, indigenous right indigenous forms of of political claims making um, and and contesting power. Um, I guess I'll I'll mention a book I'm I'm reviewing right now by Sarah Hines called I have it right here called Water for All um, and it's on the the history of of hydraulic projects and policy and and um, water um, water as either a private property or water as a part of the commons. Um, uh, from the 19th century, mid 19th century uh, in independent Bolivia, all the way through those famous water wars in, in Cochabamba uh, from in the year 2000, and she talks about this uh, this this vernacular hydraulic practice and, techn and technology 
um, that you know indigenous folks in the countryside, indigenous folks in the cities, also you know sort of quote unquote mestizo folks, um, they help kind of form this this kind of uh, hydraulic politics of the commons, right? Where water is a shared resource um, based on reciprocity, right? Based on, you know, a, a sense of the commonwealth. Um, and so not to, you know, not to fetishize or romanticize indigeneity, because in fact, a lot of these people are who do this, who, who, who advance this kind of politics of the commons are not indigenous. Um, but I think we need more, you know, um, as many people have talked about already, we need more UPE and especially urban environmental history that's been so US and Europe focused um, that traces the technosphere across these vast scalar um, expanses, as well as the challenges to it um, and the, you know, the ways in which people um, 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 are, are remaking, right? Remaking the technosphere. Um, within these uh, relationships of empire, and in the case of Bolivia, this kind of internal colonialism. Um, so I guess I'll end with that, um, kind of thinking also about, you know, along the lines of what Maria and Carl said, looking forward, right? How can we build an alternative future in which, you know, at least climate destabilization is not the end-all be-all of, of, of um, life on Earth. So... Thank you so much for, for everyone, everyone. Thank you so much, Matthew, Maria, and Carl, for your, for your interventions. Um, once once um, we, we talk about cases and research, things um, get completely synergetic. And it's, it's, it was really lovely to hear you all talk and also to see where um, you're complementary in 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 your views, bringing in um, Maria, you know your pile of bricks, you know global local relations, cause, investment, effects, socio-ecological effects, bringing to bringing them together. Um, Carl, you 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 bringing in the, the specificity specificity of the place, like what Ilya also talked about, you know, looking at all these different kinds of places and at this multi-causal um relations you know that that open up when you focus on these on these uh on these spaces and matthew yeah that's what environmental history is really kind of contributing to i think uh, it's central is is it's labor it's social relations it's um bringing that into uh the debate which is i think a crucial um, um perspective um, so thank you all. I, I will give the floor to Wangui. She's back. <laughs> she found a way to solve the technical problem um, uh, to, to wrap up. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, uh, earlier Matthew had said the third world was kind of a project. And I really, I like that project, except when it means that my electricity will go out for 10 minutes during a talk. So my apologies. I'm. I feel uh, really, I feel a bit inadequate to conclude because I missed about 10 minutes of our conversation. But I really am grateful for the generosity you've all brought to the table, the engagement that you've all had. And I hope that this can continue outside of this forum and also in the rest of the events that constitute this series. The next event is Critical Archives, if I'm not mistaken, and it's on March. Uh, I'll just open the poster. It's on March 5th. So we're really, we hope that you can uh, join us then. I'm uh, sorry, it's called Archival Futures uh, and it's on March 5th and you can find information to register on the GAP website. But thank you so much. I personally have found UPE really helpful in, in helping me think about how nature is mobilized in many ways in, in Nairobi. So I'm really grateful for this discussion and I'm happy to say thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. I have to say, Wangui offered uh, to the book uh, one of the most original and uh, inspiring chapters. So thank you for that, Wangui. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.